Hey team, Dr. Jack Audi here, and in the previous video, I jumped into what is an ANOVA and what is a T-test. These are the basic statistical tests that we all like to do. But at the end of it, I mentioned actually it's not a helpful paradigm to think about. It's not worth thinking about T-tests and ANOVAs. And why is that? Because everything really is a linear model. Most statistical tests that you will do are some form of a linear model. So it's much better to think about overlaying an appropriate statistical model, right? Choose your, look at your data and overlay an appropriate statistical model did that model explain a significant amount of variation right was was that model explanatory did it explain a significant amount of variation did that variation reduce once we overlaid our statistical model and i kind of just left that there as a teaser at the end of the videos without really answering this quite obvious question what is a statistical model well so before we jump and do statistical models, we need to touch back on philosophy, right? We always have to go back and look at our philosophical foundation of science before we start trying to layer on complicated things like what is a st statistical model. This is my man Karl Popper here, um, one of the greatest philosophers of all time, and he came up with how do we evaluate whether it's a good biological theory or not. And he said a good biological theory um, must make predictions, and by making a prediction, it is falsifiable by running an experiment to falsify the prediction that that theory makes. The prediction should be useful and tell us about how the world should behave, and the more specific the prediction, the more useful the theory is. They should give you a hint about what a statistical model is, is it's all about making predictions. Let me explain. So a statistical model is a mathematical process which attempts to describe the population based on the sample that it came from. So remember, we can never see the whole population. I can never look at all human beings on the planet. If I run an experiment on eight mice, um, there are an infinite number of mice that could have been experimented on. <laughs> it sounded horrible. But what I'm saying is, when we run an experiment, we're sampling from a theoretical population of an infinite number of samples, right? Because you probably want to repeat my experiment. Scientists like to repeat other people's experiments to double check right you can't just do one experiment and say that's that partly because a p-value remember is 1 in 20 so there's a 1 in 20 chance that that result you got just occurred by chance or more extreme uh, occurred by chance remember that's the definition of a p-value so we like to repeat it right we've got to repeat these results so when I run my statistical model I'm making a prediction about what will happen if you run the same experiment right I'm trying to predict the future sample that you will take. If I do a clinical trial on the Pfizer vaccine, I'm trying to draw, um, uh, I'm trying to build a statistical model that will predict what happens when we roll out that vaccine to the rest of the population, right? So that's what a statistical model is. It's um, a mathematical process attempting to evaluate what the population would look like given the sample that you took from it. Now, this, uh, statistical models can be super complicated, so this is global warming. Now, you might think, hold on a minute, how is this sampling from a population? Well, remember, when they measured the CO2 levels, when they measured the temperatures of the ocean and of the air, they didn't measure every single temperature that you could possibly measure on the planet. They didn't sample the entire atmosphere. Those parameters are still out there as a population, right? They just took a temperature here, a temperature there, thousands of temperatures across across the globe, but they didn't look at the entire population. And what that means is they're making a prediction about what that population, which is the climate, looks like. What does the temperature look like? What does the emissions look like? And the great thing about stats is that it can allow us to predict future samples. Given the samples we have now, what are future samples going to look like given that they come from that population and given that I can describe what is happening to that population. So that population could be a population of people or it could be a population of theoretical infinite temperature samples we could take across the globe. Literally, if the surface of the Earth was covered in thermometers, um, that is the population from which one thermometer is taking a sample from, if you think about it like that. So, statistical models can be very complex. As you can see, the future does not look bright, and I'm sorry, guys, but please, governments, uh, do something about global warming, you sons of guns. Anyway...
<laughs> anyway, so given that, given all of everything I've said, let me ask you this question. Is a mean a statistical model? Remember, mean is just average, so you just add up all your data, divide it by the sample number. That's your mean. Is a mean a statistical model? The answer is yes, of course means are statistical models. They're attempting to guess what the expected value, what's the predicted value that you would get if you took a random sample from the population. So that's what a mean is. Here is a couple of means here from an actual clinical trial on ivermectin versus placebo, looking at viral load of COVID-19 in the nasal cavity of these patients. Placebo versus ivermectin. You can see there's not a lot of effect there. And so means are statistical models. Other stats as well, like proportions are statistical models here we have three days of ivermectin treatment what proportion of 250 patients um, were still were negative and what proportion were positive for COVID-19 after three days viral state of, of um, three days of treatment and we can see that there's no difference here they followed this trial out forever and they found no statistical significant difference of ivermectin but it was only one clinical trial Keep an eye out. There's a big Oxford clinical trial which has over 6,000 people enrolled so far on ivermectin. So keep a close eye on what's happening with that Oxford trial. It could be very interesting. Right, so, um, yeah, means are statistical models, proportions are statistical models, linear regressions are statistical models, ANOVAs, because ANOVAs rely on means, they're just statistical models, right? So these are all just overlaying a statistical model and looking at variation, uh, explained variation versus unexplained variation. Now we can run a simple model on this data, so this is knowledge of immunology versus coolness. So clearly you are cooler the more immunology you know. This is real data, don't question it, don't try and repeat it. Um, so you can run a nice linear regression over the top of that and you see this nice significant result there. But you could also run a complicated model. I don't know what this would be, a definitely a polynomial model there, but you could run a very complicated statistical algorithm model over the top of the data right there. So models can be simple and models can be complex, right? Now, wouldn't a complex model be better? Wouldn't you just want a complex model? Because explained variation is good, right? If we remember how our stats test often work, is they take a, a, a set of data like this, they run a model over it, so this is a linear regression, but this could be a mean. Then they look at how far the data points are from that um, expected value, that linear regression. So this is the this is the data point, this is what we expected the data point to be, so the variation is the distance between that two. And we can see that there's little variation there. Now, what if we got rid of our explanatory variable and we just put all the data together? So this blue dot corresponds to that blue dot, green to green, pink to pink. You can see this is um, that exact data just over here. <clears throat> but now I've combined it. Now let's look at the variation. The variation away from the mean is huge. We've got big variation on this side without our explanatory variable, without our statistical model. We've got a big variation. And over here, we've got little average variation. So if we take the average variation over here and the average variation over there, we can now um, have a look and we can see that a huge proportion disappeared with our statistical model. That's explained variation. The variation in the data disappeared when we overlaid our statistical model. Fantastic. Fantastic. There was still a little bit of unexplained variation, right? The dots didn't sit perfectly on the line there. And so when we run our F ratio, we get a nice big uh, F ratio, so we get a nice small P value, right? So that's how we run stats tests, and that's how we should think about statistical models, explained versus unexplained variation. But if we go back and look at this, don't we have little variation over here, and we have no variation over there, because we've managed to build a statistical model so complex that it managed to go exactly through all the data points. What's wrong with that? Is an explained variation good? That's when we come up to these two things that I haven't yet introduced. One is statistical power and one is degrees of freedom. And they're integrally related. They're very, they are the yin and yang. They are the two sides of the same coin. Whatever saying you want, they're very closely related together. So statistical power, I'm going to start with that because I think we have an intuition for statistical power. I think we kind of get it at our core, the maths is a bit dodgy, but we get it at our core. So let's look at this. So we've got snot production on the y-axis, we've got placebo, and we've got an antihistamine. 
Now, we can see that there's some decline there, but if we run the, uh, here's our means there, that's the statistical model that we're running over this data, and then we look at the p-value, it's not statistically significant. Could we then conclude that the antihistamines don't work? based off an N of three. I think we intuitively know that we're not really confident in our statistical model with such small Ns, right? With such a small sample number, we're not really confident of it. And that's because there's low statistical power. Now, if we ran that again with more uh, patients, this time, you know, maybe 20 in each group, we get a statistically significant result. So the first result wasn't caused by the fact that antihistamines don't work. It was caused by the fact that we underpowered our study. We didn't have statistical power. So what statistical power means is it means given how you've designed your study, what small an effect size could you detect? How small a difference could you detect? Are your results reliable, repeatable, and is the lack of significance meaningful? This is all wrapped up in this concept of statistical power. Now, obviously, more ends are good, right? The more ends we run an experiment, the better. But, you know, there's ethical considerations and cost considerations. Is it ethical to test antihistamines on 10,000 mice? The answer is probably no. And so we need to figure out a number there that balances a fixed size that we want to be able to detect, statistical power, cost, and the ethics of it and this is a whole bunch of statistics that we call um, power tests or statistical power tests and so we actually run these complicated stats to figure out how many should we have in our trial to get a good study going on but statistical power can do more than just be designate whether your result is good or not it can actually tell us what model should we apply so here we've got histamine uh, concentration in our blood versus snot production and we've got this like shape here now you could run a linear graph through that and that looks fairly reasonable but you could also run a bit more of a complicated a statistical model maybe a quadratic which you could run through that and that seems to go through all the dots but I think we intuitively know with an N of three, we don't really know which model to run. It could be a linear regression or it could be the quadratic. We don't actually know the relationship between histamine and snot production, right? So with an N of three, we don't really know which statistical model. We don't have the statistical power to decide what statistical model we should put through that. Now, if we had a greater N, um, now we can see that the linear regression doesn't really fit it, but the quadratic fits it quite well. So now it seems worth choosing the more complicated model over the less complicated model. But if we go back, actually, I'm just going to nip back it's through quite a few slides, a little bit disorganized here. If we go back to this, I think we intuitively know that the less complicated model is better. Even though this model goes through all the data points, I think we intuitively understand that the statistical power isn't there to know that this model goes like this. It seems insane, right? And it's probably this model. So how do we get past intuition, right? We're just talking about intuition, about knowing whether it's a linear regression or whether it's a curve and we can see that with this data the curve seems reasonable well this is where the other guy comes into the equation degrees of freedom now i'm going to explain this complicated term in the next video because it's so important to get a really good grasp on degrees of freedom not just some random calculation like n minus one or k minus n or j minus k or whatever you've been taught if you've been taught n overs i want you to get a real good gut feel for what a degree of freedom is when it relates to statistics so that's coming up next in the next video i know you guys can't wait so just click on that immediately Thanks team, like, subscribe, comment, ask questions, email me, check out my website, do whatever you want. <laughs> Bye team.